Hello, Adrian. How are you doing, Maria? Oh, yeah. Hello, Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom W., as I think of you now. Yeah, hi. Hey. I'm, I'm looking that. out at Port Madison right now. It's oh, right. It's good. <laughs> Adrian. Adrian. The, the mud. The mud is giving me a shout, huh? Yes. Oh, dear. Today's topic is what's new with access. I had the great fortune last week to go to uh, back to an in, in-person MVP summit, and I thought that I would kind of just talk a little bit about what's new with access, understanding, of course, that there are some things that I can't tell you. There are plenty of items that are fairly new that I can share and other helpful information today. This is a picture of myself and Juan Ho, who is the Spanish Access User Group Chapter President and a co-president, I think. I think he and another gentleman lead it. And then this is Mike. Mike has been an MVP for a little over a year. And Juan Ho, uh, just maybe not even six months, probably. And so it was Juan Ho's first conference. And indeed, let me see, let me pull up this other picture that Crystal just sent, if I can. So this is Juan Ho in front of the Microsoft sign. What was it like? So this was the first hybrid MVP conference in history. It used to be prior to COVID or BC, as me and my friends have been calling it before COVID, it was only in person. So if you were an MVP and you were not fortunate enough to be able to attend the conference in person, you missed out on the contact that they provided. And that was, you know, sad. But uh, back in the day, you know, this was information and some of it was yet not yet announced information that we were able to get at the conference and they wanted to make sure everything was very secure you know and nobody got content uh before they could and then when covid hit they had to do something in a hurry we had a conference that was like i think a month out and suddenly they were scrambling and the whole thing went virtual and so we had it on Teams. It was very secure. And the past couple of years has only been virtually. And so this was the first conference that we got to the opportunity to go in person. There are approximately 3,000 MVPs right now across all kinds of different fields or specialties. And we had about 1,000 there in person and about 2,000 attended remotely. And this is actually a a wall that they have all of the MVP names on. They're all the way across here. And it's, I believe it was first name, then last name. So, and they're in like first name order going like this. And so I'm kind of in here someplace. It's way too small for you to see. This was a big photo opportunity. A lot of people tried to get their picture in front of it. I saw some people posting on LinkedIn with their name circled and that kind of thing. <laughs> what we got this year, we had three days of sessions. Most of them were both in-person and virtual. A few of them were virtual only. Microsoft provided all the breakfasts and lunches for us if you attended there. And the M365 team had a happy hour one evening. We had four sessions devoted to Microsoft Access and five members of the Access team plus Michael Aldridge, who is our old product manager, uh, his boss attended some of them as well, uh, the Access sessions. Michael's old boss is now committed to driving the project manager interim position, and Dale Rector, then, who is one of the members of the access team, is doing most of the work, you know, at their direction to provide an interim project manager support. 
And uh, they are trying to hire a new project manager. Now, understand that I'm sure you've all heard about Microsoft recent layoffs that kind of ties their hand behind their back doing something like that. So it might be a little while before we get a new product manager. They are actively doing that. We did get active sessions. Although the summit wasn't as whining and dining as it has been in some years of history pre-COVID, it was still active. Microsoft's investing in us. They are investing in Microsoft Access as well, not to some, the degree that they are in some of the other products, but, you know, it's still alive and kicking, and we have people helping us out here. This is a link to today's presentation. One of the things that we talked about a little bit was some of the improvements to the Dataverse connector that have been done recently. And I must admit that even though all of these items are out there in the current channel at the moment, they don't appear in the release notes anywhere that I could find. So I thought this was information that you would want to see. And you you will see a little bit later when we talk about one of the blog posts that Michael Aldrich did back in, I think, October, where he talked about what was coming up for the next six months and what they would be working on. Some of these items are indeed on that list, and they have been worked in. So, yes, Ben, right now we do not have a program manager for access. Michael Aldrich has a different position. He's now a program manager for one of the other, I don't know if anyone knows what he's doing now. I've kind of lost track. Um, loop. Loop. For what? Loop. Loop? Okay. Yep. For Microsoft I, loop. Which I have no idea what it is. I think it has to do with like teams and employee and keeping your employees and your organization informed and uh, and uh, kind of an ex a little bit like an extension of teams or a different organization anyway what i'm going to post next in the chat here is a link to a youtube presentation from an access lunchtime about well i think it was last February, not this past February, but the February before that, that I did on the Dataverse connector. These items that are listed here will not be part of that presentation, but that gives you some background information about the Dataverse connector in Microsoft Access. If you are un totally unfamiliar with it, you could also watch that YouTube recording. But in the original release of it, which I believe went to current channel in like April of last year. So about a year ago, there was not support for uploading into Dataverse from Access a single field or a double field, but now there is. And what happens when you do that is you do get a warning, this warning that's up here at the top it tells you that basically there's not full support for single or double, but you have some warnings about types to look for in your data that might not transfer over because they're too large or something like that. So it does give you information, and then you can just click the ignore this message, and it will go on and export now, in the test that I did, the single and number, double numbers that I had, you know, were well within the range here and the precision level that we were talking about. And so it wasn't an issue. But if it is an issue, then you, like it says here, you might want to use a different approach, like converting that to a decimal instead. 
It also now supports rich text. That was one of the field types that it didn't support originally. And so now that is supported. There's also the ability to export directly to a Dataverse solution. I don't know if you're familiar with Dataverse solutions. The default is a default solution, but then you can create your own solution and put items into a solution. And it is that solution that allows lifecycle management within Dataverse. So after this screen here with the validation and stuff, if you've checked this box right here, which is a new box to specify the Dataverse solution for export. Then after this screen, it will pop up another screen and it lists all the solutions in the Dataverse environment that you chose in this first step. And you can pick the solution that you want to export to. Prior to this, it only exported to the default solution, and then you had to manually move your items into the solution you wanted it to if you were using solutions, which is a good idea to use so you can get that full lifecycle management ability. And then at the very end, after everything's all done, there's a new export report via a table button. And if you hit that, you actually get a new table that appears in your access database that shows the status of everything that you exported. So it has a row for each table you exported. And then there's like the number of rows that exported, the number of columns that exported, a URL link to the new table. That's on the all done screen where you get that. So there's several new things for the Dataverse connector. Then if you missed last month's presentation, thanks to our wonderful and talented Crystal, who is on today's meeting, we just recently posted that presentation to YouTube, and I just put a link to that in the chat. Last month, I covered the new Edge web browser, and I believe it's still in the process of fully rolling out in current. It is available in the current channel preview. And, uh, but I did learn a couple things at that, that are non uh, NDA at the conference about it. It's things that I didn't realize before and didn't specifically talk about in this video. So I did want to bring those to your attention. When you have the new edge browser in a form in access and you've got a URL link and there's a, another link to a different URL inside of, uh, you know, on that web page. If that is considered a non-trusted domain by the web browser control and you hit it, it actually opens it in your Edge browser outside of Access. And that is one way that you can tell if it's a non-trusted domain or not. So there's a new property where you can set a table name and you can put in that table, the first column, a list of trusted domains. So if you see that kind of thing happening, you probably don't want that. You probably want things to stay inside your Access Edge web browser control. And so you could add those domains to your trusted locations table to prevent that type of thing. And I really didn't realize that I, I didn't understand why it sometimes did that and why it did not, but, but that is why. So it does let you to browse to those things. It doesn't just doesn't let you browse to them from inside access. There also was a couple issues that some of us reported, and I know Colin also has a post on the Edge web browser and some good information. 
there was an issue with local PDFs not working correctly, and that issue is fixed. There was an issue that if you gave one of the objects invalid JavaScript, it would just hang access instead of performing nicely. And so that has also been fixed. It no longer hangs access, but does just basically do nothing if the JavaScript is invalid. And that's not atypical of JavaScript. You have to find a debugger and debug it and that kind of thing. And then finally, something that they pointed out that I never thought of, you can use the web browser on a continuous form. If you think about it, if you had a form with a list of websites and then kind of a preview of each website, you know, taking up some space on the right side of the form, much like you would do with a directory and pictures of people or something like that. It might be really handy. That's something we couldn't do with the old web browser control, but we can do that with a new edge browser control. Now, digital signing. Digital signing, uh, I covered in a webinar late this fall, maybe the December session. It's a new feature. And there is a recent addition. If the original certificate, and, and this is actually straight from release notes, recent release notes. So if the original certificate that was used to sign an access database or VBA project is present on a machine, then you can now save the VBA project and it updates the signature for you. So you don't have to be so careful. When we first were, were doing this, even if you didn't change anything and you just hit the save button from the VBA window, that was invalidating the certificate and you had to go back and re-sign it. Well, that, if you're working on your development machine where you have that certificate installed, you no longer have to go through all that. You can just sign it once and then you can make changes and it's kind of all re-signed for you each time you save things. And so that I think is a wonderful addition. Of course, if you go to a different machine where you don't have the signature, these digital signatures are generally per machine. I think you can, in an environment, have multiple machines that are allowed to use a signature, but in general, they're, they're kind of machine-oriented. So once you take the application to a different machine and you try to edit it, then that does invalidate the signature, which is what you want. You know, you don't want your customers editing the project you want them to be using what you gave them if you sign it. That's really about it as far as features that I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about communication surrounding the product. First of all, I think we all know that the Microsoft 365 Roadmaps has problems. Right now, it has two items on it, and they both happen to be uh, maybe slightly different versions of the same item, the, the Edge web browser. For some reason, the digital signing never made it to the roadmap at all. We heard last fall that the access team was going to have a new philosophy where they didn't put things on the Microsoft 365 roadmap under the access product unless they were 90% sure that they were going to be delivering it. But, you know, the fact is that they're still, they're having problems, I think, internally, not with the access team per se, but with Microsoft roadmap or whoever owns that, getting things 
published on there in a timely manner, getting things updated on there correctly or in a timely manner. There were several suggestions from people saying, you know, why can't you just put it on there and not put a date? That's not possible the way it works. So we understand that it has problems. They will still try to use it, but they have a lot of paperwork and rigmarole to get through to get anything on there. So please understand that that's part of why you don't see some features and upcoming priorities on that roadmap. I do have a reference here uh, to a blog post, and this is in Microsoft Tech Community. If you go to that and look at the Access blog, back in October, this was the last time that Michael Aldrich posted a post about the priorities, and this was for six months. It was starting in October and going through March. So if you take a look at that, maybe I should pull that up. Okay, so here's the Access blog. They've been very faithfully publicizing bug fixes and listing all the bug fixes. They've done a lot of them. I think Carl Donabauer recently counted them up and added up all these. I think it's like 37. And I think they have also fixed some bugs that aren't on their lists as well. So quite a few bug fixes rolled out in the last six months. Here's the R road ahead. And so this is what they were thinking six months ago. They were thinking to continue their focus on monthly issues and have a blog post where they posted all those issues. I think they did a fantastic job about that. Almost every month we got a blog post. We got 37 plus issues fixed. We have the inconsistent database error fix. They are still working on that. As you know, it's been years and efforts are slow, but that is still being looked at. Then we have items three through seven, new macro signing support, new modern web browser control, dataverse connector data type support for floating point, for rich text, and for exporting to a Dataverse solution or publisher. All of those items, three through seven, are now available. So I think that's fantastic. You don't see anything on there besides the inconsistent database error fix, but I, I do understand they're trying to get another blog post out there with their next six months priorities. So I'm anxiously awaiting that and hopefully we can see that soon. I do want you to understand that partially because of the cutbacks at Microsoft, not only in the total personnel that they have to work with, but different teams and the priorities of some of the other teams versus some of the more mature products like Access that don't get as many team members assigned to them, they have a limited amount of resources. So it's very important for us to provide them feedback. And so I've listed a link here to Microsoft's current feedback forum. And if you haven't visited it in a while, it's very different from the old forum. I like it a lot better. You can search for items that others have suggested. You can vote for them. You can add new ones. The access team is working very hard on trying to keep this a usable tool for us. They're working to prevent items from disappearing they're working to review it at least monthly, clean out junk. Unfortunately, the term access, they get posts in there that are something like, I don't have access to such and such file on such and such system. And they get stuff like that on there. That's just garbage for us because the word access means different things to different people. It's also listed first on the uh, alphabetical order for the items. 
And so they get junk in there. They get spam, you know, but they're going to work at cleaning that out. They're going to keep working on consolidating similar items so that we can get a fair vote on a feature and also on keeping the statuses up to date. So if you really want something to happen soon, please put it in the feedback or search for it on the feedback and vote for it because they really use that and the amount of votes that they have to help prioritize the order at which they do things. Their to-do list, like I'm sure you realize, is huge and they can only do so many things. So the GUI of the feedback portal has become sluggish, Donna. Is that what you're saying? When working in the GUI itself, like if you filter, search for something, it can take like 10 seconds for it to, and it doesn't matter what machine I'm on, I've been using You're talking about in access? Yeah. Yes. Like the, the entire GUI, like it used to be quite speedy, even now though, like if you're using the shutter bar and then you search for something, it can take like a couple seconds to filter that out or to even just to clear the filter or to open something up in design view, or I've just noticed it's gotten sluggish over time. That's all. Hmm, I don't see that. Are you by any chance working in a trusted location? Uh, yeah. Okay. If anyone else has some hints for that, you know, I would make sure that you're, are you working on a, yeah, on a, over a network is my other, um, nope, Jim nope, said, local. just on your C drive. Yeah, on an SD, uh, SD drive, so, and a Skooka machine, an i7. Put a short path to the back end, see if that makes a difference. No, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. Hmm. I, I don't talk, I'm not talking about access to data. I'm talking about actually developing and, and working in the, in the GUI. Like, so you open your shutter bar and you're like, you're searching for an object. Like, let's say I'm searching for a form and I filter down mm-hmm. so that I can see my forms or whatever. It's like one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. And then when I clear the filter at the top, it's one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three. And it doesn't matter what machine I'm on or where, or, or I have 32 gigs of RAM on my machine. And mm-hmm. I've been working in Access for, well, since 2.0. And yeah, I, just I, I would look to other things like make sure if maybe if you have a antivirus product, try turning it off and see if you get no. the same speed. I know. No, that, um, I know that's a standard thing is to, yeah. to turn off on ACCDBs and all that. And you probably compiled it, right? Oh, 100%. Okay, have you, de- have you decompiled it? Yep. Okay, yeah, it's, and it's, the other it's, thing is it's to the turn interface off. itself. It's the interface itself. Yeah. It's and not. Turn it's, off, yeah, turn off autocorrect. Maybe it's oh, I always do. I Okay, so one. that's yeah. done too. Oh gosh, I, I'm talking about working within the interface itself. So, like, you know, um, just just working, do development, and you know, sometimes like, if I have, if I open up a form in Design View and I say View Code, it can take forever. And the other thing that I cannot understand why Access has never put in is a close all windows, like when you're in the VBA editor. Like, you know, it well, opens that's up. A, that's a good thing to suggest for the feedback forum. However, you do need to understand that some of the things are product. Other things, in, in particular, VBA type changes, that's owned because VBA is shared by all, well, not all of the project products, but many of the products, that's actually owned by a different team. So I think that they will still take your feedback on some of those items, but who owns that and who decides and where the priorities are for that. So Neil says close all is available on right click. I don't know if you've tried that. Anyway, let's let's keep going on my slides here so we can make sure we finish them and then we can take random questions and stuff at the end here. I also listed a website 
um, that's relatively new um, and our our, I think, oldest uh, access MVP, uh, Carl Donabauer, created this, and he's got about five people, I think, now, five developers, very experienced developers, helping him with this and with blogs on this. And I particularly like the post on how to counter rumors of access demise. I know I get this kind of thing from my customers or potential customers actually usually, you know, they're like, if I suggest Microsoft Access as an option for them, they're like, Access, that's dead, isn't it? That's going away. You know, product support ended or, you know, something like that. So it's it's a, got some great, that particular blog post has some great ways to show people that, Microsoft Access product is not dead. It's not dying. Maybe it's very mature and doesn't get lots of brand new changes, uh, but it's still actively being developed. It's not going out of support as long as you're keeping up on the versions or working on a perpetual version. So um, I take a look at that. Other news about Microsoft Access. First of all, Access DevCon, I don't know if you're already registered, but if you are not, that is later this week. And I think registration is still open. Latest numbers that we know of are maybe 150 developers already signed up for this. There is a small fee for it, but I've attended it the past couple of years. In fact, I spoke at it last year, and this is the uh, schedule for it. It's it's um, if you just search for DevCon or DevCon Vienna, you can find it. But this is the link uh, doncarl.com/devcon. I ha- happen to look at the agenda right here, and in particular, there's one of the items on the agenda. That is an update by the access team. These are the five people that were at our summit and and at most of the access sessions. And notice the first three topics were some of the topics that I talked about today. Dataverse integration enhancements, advanced macro security features. That's the signing function, next generation browser control. So those are all items that are in production, but they also have here listed a peer into the future. They did peer into the future for the MVP team, but that is information I'm not available to share with you today. But often during this kind of a a talk, they do share some of those things with you. And so if you want to hear those now, instead of you know, later when they actually become in production items, this is a a great session to go to. There's some other fantastic sessions. The actual schedule wise, I don't think they're the first one access update. They're nine o'clock Pacific time. So like for me, that would be 11 a.m. because they're out on the West Coast, 7 a.m. Pacific time. It's pretty darn early for them. So we've got a couple other sessions before their update. They are on there that first day. We've got, this is uh, Mike Wolf, which is one of the new MVPs giving a talk. Um, there's a gentleman talking about Dataverse. Colin, who is uh, our uh, Access Europe chapter president is going to be talking. Crystal, who um, helps us out with our videos and also has Learn Access by Crystal, is giving a talk. George Young, I think he is the Denver Access Group. This is help content. And then Northwind 2. So there's going to be an introduction to that. We are also going to get a Northwind 2 introduction next month at Access Lunchtime. It'll be a little bit more in in detail here. Um, So here's some of the others. 
let's see, we also have Microsoft Build coming up. That is uh, about a month from now, the 23rd and 25th of May. There is a way to go virtually. So this is the uh, build.microsoft.com. Home, build.microsoft.com. I will just say that expect some awesome announcements at this. I know I'm going. So let's see, session wise, there's a lot of sessions available. And you can take a look at what sessions are there if you're interested in it. Oh, our Access Users Group. So accessusersgroup.org is the website. And then this is our YouTube channel. YouTube.com at Access User Groups. So those are great places to go for other information about access as well. So here's the bit about next access lunchtime, Tuesday, May 30th. For those in the U.S., that's the day after Memorial Day. Tom Van Stipout, who is an access MVP, and Kim Young, who has been an access uh, developer for years and years and years, will tell us all about Northwind 2.0. And finally, I just left you the links to those resources that I added for uh, in, the, in the chat about the various presentations we've done in the past about these three newer features. So that's all I have. If there's any specific questions people have, feel free to hmm. ask. Chris, Crystal just wrote something which I didn't know. But Northwind 2 is available now. I Yes. Yes, it is. Do you have a link, Crystal? It's in the templates. Uh, yeah. You just uh, open okay. up Access, and you have to search templates, though, because I've already downloaded Northwind. But if you click uh, where the magnifier is and type in Northwind and do a search, you can see three of them now. Okay. And are they labeled well? I didn't look close enough to read that. I didn't get them yet. I just saw they were there. Okay. It's my understanding, and I'm sure I'm going to hear more official at whatever presentation they're at. I don't know. I'm not sure whether it's Thursday or Friday at Access DevCon, but my, my understanding is there's going to be like a basic one and then one that's more designed for developers, one that's a little bit more more difficult or more advanced techniques they are labeled as crystal said if you do the search you will get the three of them dev edition starter edition and the old legacy yeah and i honestly don't remember the or don't recommend the old legacy anymore i mean the reason that they did the 2.0 is that all of us hated the original Northwind, it was so out of date and it seemed so, like, as a developer, it just it was like, why would you do that? <laughs> so. Tom W's made a good um, point in the chat that um, it's not had its proper release yet. So you won't, you won't necessarily see too much about it yet until they they do their announcement but you will have a chance to to hear about it if you uh, register for DevCon. And the, as Maria, I think Maria said, the latest you can do that is today. Well, and, and it's uh, supposed to be end of day. And this is, remember, a, I, I think it's actually based in Vienna, Austria. So remember that their day ends before... <laughs> day does so my suggestion is if you haven't signed up yet and you're interested immediately after this session go do that <laughs> so don't uh, risk not being able to attend so i put a link in the chat for the registration you did yeah some message okay. back but it's in there oh, right <laughs> uh, crystal can i suggest if you have it 
to hand. If you pop it back in the chat now, uh, it will be easier for people to access. Okay. Uh, Worthwhile. Doing that now. All right. I just posted yes. it again. Indeed, you did. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's almost 8 p.m. already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure they'll they'll allow for a few more of us. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like Maria said, it is a good idea to kind of be quick about it. Well, I'm hoping you're already registered, Crystal, because you're presenting. Yes, indeed. Well, and I, I like I said, I have um, attended it the last two years and, and I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of interesting information, so. Definitely. And today is great. You know, our sessions are great, but they're only once a month. And so to have them all in a couple days. And if for some reason you've got something going on during one of the sessions, um, they do record them. And if you register, then they send you a link to it for you to view it afterwards if you missed it or something, or even if you attended and saw it and you're just like, oh, I want to see again how Crystal does this on reports. Donna's just commented that the video, I assume, oh, uh, yes, that Crystal posted a VBA signing in Microsoft Access. And Donna's saying that that video is no longer available. Oh, let me check that out. Oh, I, I copied the link. I, I, I just posted the same links Maria did. I labeled them, though. I looked up what they were and right. labeled them. It's all oh. good. But if, if, it is that, if it's true that they're no longer available, ah, someone says she's found it. Uh, Donna said she's found it. I don't know okay. exactly how it that was, came it was, about. It was weird. I No, I just typed the URL in, and I double-checked it, and, but then I just did a search in YouTube uh, for the title, and I found it, so that was weird. But with a different link, presumably, so. I just linked on it, and it works. Okay, thank you. So do feel free to come off mute and or put your camera back on if you want to. We can chat about whatever you would like. Um, I did see a couple posts in here about things that they would like. Do make sure you put those in the feedback. I think it's great to talk about them, but I'm not going to be organized enough to, you know, add your suggestions from chat here to feedback myself. Unfortunately, um, you'll want to explain a little bit more about it anyway yourself. So are they are they saying that they're taking more notice of that than they did of the user voice because the user voice um, forum sort of lost its momentum, didn't it? I think user voice is no longer active. I think they're <clears throat> really looking at them a lot more now because everybody was uh, putting stuff into user voice, got discouraged because the comments weren't migrated. So not very many people are even posting over there in feedback. So. You know, there's there's less to look at, so I'm sure they can have the time to look at all of them, and they really, really want us to use it. And that was one of the complaints, was that people didn't like not getting a response. So I think they're being more responsive, but I'm one of those ones that hasn't tried it yet, so I can't speak from experience, but I do plan to. You'll put it uh, see some sort of search thing in the... Um... You know, some, some nice to have some wildcard support in the navigator bar. You said it is nice, or it would, it would be, be nice. nice. It would be nice if you've got if you've got sort of hundreds of objects in your database. It would be nice to actually filter them uh, down I by wildcarding. There was. Sorry, I didn't catch that. What what was that that you were saying? What are you looking for? In the navigator bar, you can uh, filter down to see just a, a collection of forms or a collection of queries, but it'd be nice to have a wildcard support in there. So for example, oh, I, I if, if you, for example, if you've got a table query and form with matching names, it'd be nice to put, you know. 100% agree. A bit that's of the same one that I've talked about that's really slow. Like if I type like, like maybe all my far, forms to have get in them and I type get, you know, it can take a few seconds for it to filter it down. And that's clear because I mean I've got some databases with over a thousand objects, isn't it? It's always instantaneous for me. Tom W asked a question earlier. I don't know if, if we're interested in discussing. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it. I started to, and then 
I was trying to find the feedback hub. And now I'm all getting, I'm getting an app. (laughs) I don't want an app. I want the website. Anyway, Tom asked about if anyone uses Dataverse in the wild uh, for their, for their official stuff, rather than just playing around on the, on their own machine and testing it out and all the rest of it. Anyone using it for clients? Typically for access projects. Donna answered me oh, yeah, that yeah. she uses it for Power Platform, but I don't think the connector's there yet for real world through access. We were kind of waiting for it because we were trying to decide if we were going to use access connected to Dataverse or if we were going to do SQL Azure. We were just kind of playing around with some ideas and with the connector at the state it was last year, it it just wasn't there. So you know, but I, here you showed in the roadmap that they did three of their bug fixes in Access were Dataverse related, but yes. they have no connector for Access? It, they do have a connector. In my opinion, it's not super usable yet. Great. It's very slow. If you get If you're doing a very simple application, it's probably fine. But if you get too many records, it's too slow right now. I've had clients try it, and maybe one of the relationships that they wanted wasn't there, and it was hard to port. I had another one where it just stopped after hours and hours of trying to upload their data. But again, I do think that they're trying to work on those things. Hopefully, we will see improvements in that to make it more usable. I could be wrong, but it just... I get the feeling that Dataverse is a field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. I don't know. It just seems like it was... Uh... So so the reason for it had to do with people that were more at the, the upper level wanting governance to data. And let's just face it. If, if you've got something in SQL, you might be fine, right? But if you have an access backend on a network, it's really hard to apply the proper governance to that and security and that kind of thing. So that is the main impetus for the effort is is those clients who were wanting to make sure their data was in that kind of controlled, governable environment. Without going to a true relational database, whether it be SQL Server or Oracle yeah, and the the theory whatever. is even Azure SQL requires someone with knowledge of SQL to be able to manage it. So there's things like you know users and that kind of stuff that you have to manage in that. And I guess does it I take guess my other PA? question maybe not, but my other question is. What are the costs of trying to use Dataverse for for your customer? If you bring that as a possible solution, what uh, you know? What are the implications for a client? You know, as far as the bill you that need, they'll be facing. You, you need a per app license, or you need well, they used to call it the P two license. So it can get fairly expensive if you're just doing a single app. It's like five or ten dollars per user, but if you want to do multiple apps and use the dataverse, then it gets spendy. My impression is that it, it all builds up to a, a lot of money. It's not a cheap option. Um, I do know that the the licensing is complicated and I myself would love to see an estimator, you know, similar to I think SQL Azure has this where you can say this is what I want to do and this is how much it's going to cost. Right. And you can have like a plan because if you are proposing this to a client, you have to know ahead of time. You can't just say, well, uh, exactly. You You don't come off as too knowledgeable. No. And it's super hard to read all the details because it does matter if they've, if they're a big client and they've already got certain licenses for, some products that already have a dataverse environment, then I think there's little cost. But mm-hmm. most most of my clients aren't those clients. 
they're the they're small, small mom and pop shop yes. and they have no dataverse presence yet, mm-hmm. then if I understand you, you'd probably be reluctant to recommend that as a path forward. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I always mean, say that Microsoft licensing is a black art. I would say not only is it complicated, it's also not cheap. You know, you can generally get a SQL Azure for cheaper, I think. I again, I'm not into that too much. I agree with but, you. Yeah, but the only thing that I see a Dataverse is having a, a, a pull for is for what Maria just alluded to, which was clients who already do all their rubbish in Dataverse. They already have data apps. They have data, whatever the other data thing is that I can't remember. They have power apps. If you've got someone with that in, already invested in the Dataverse, then Access is able to link into that. And that's a positive. There's no going away from that. But it, that's a different thing from, from getting an Access application or a project, whatever you want to call it, and saying, right, you know, Dataverse is my back end of choice because it doesn't have a great deal to going for it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. If folks, let's say they're using Dynamics CRM or, or Business Central, their licenses will come with that advanced connector. So their license, so it it really is a lot of work to determine uh, pricing when you're looking at what your potential data store options are. I mean, at the end of the day, Microsoft Access is pretty much free if you think about it that way. Whereas if you're going to connect into, like, let's say you're going to connect into SQL Server on-prem. Well, that's free if you get yourself SQL Server Express. If you want to go SQL Azure, you can get a pretty darn cheap Azure SQL database. But when you're using it in like prime time production and a fairly extensive application, then you're going to want to go with the larger, better SQL machine. And that can cost, you know, four or five hundred dollars a month, which, again, is not a huge thing when you're talking about data. But when you start to get into Dataverse, I have a lot of clients like like say on the power platform we will store our data in SharePoint just because of the cost of licensing for these for some of these businesses, which is not ideal at all, because, of course, it's not relational. I think it is now, Donna. It used not to be it, it used not to support relational. Um, oh, it's it supports think- like you can do lookups and stuff like that, but it's not your true RDMS. Like it's not your true relational database. It's it's not. You know, and then you get into issues when you have lots of rows, although SharePoint can um, support lots of rows, you have to watch your list views when you go look at and, you know, manipulate. If I have to manipulate SharePoint data, quite often I will connect to that SharePoint data uh, through Microsoft Access in order to manipulate it. I won't do it through the SharePoint interface um, if there's lots of rows. Sure. I'm just saying that, that, I mean, what I was told, because I don't use SharePoint a lot myself, but... I was told that a, a newer version, the, the latest versions, do support relational interactions, etc. But whether that how how valid that is, I can't I can't confirm. Well, and keep in mind that some of this depends upon what your perspective is. If you are the owner of a company what you and I might realize as a more pricey option isn't necessarily pricey to other people. If they're concerned about their data security and things like that, then they may be willing to spend the money to do that and make sure that it is secure. So. Agreed. And if you tell them about the pitfalls of not doing it, they decide that what you thought was a pricey option, they're like, oh, yeah, no, that works for us. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I wouldn't rule out Dataverse as an option because strictly on the pricing, I would like to see more planning ahead capabilities from Microsoft. I, and I think they'll get there. I think that that right. other people besides myself are telling them that, that we need this tool. Right now, the speed is is a problem connecting it with access. 
All right. Yeah, we are at time. So I guess we probably better say goodbye till next month. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you picked up at least one piece of information that you didn't know before today. And you're left here with somewhat of a warm, fuzzy feeling that access is alive today and is going to stay alive for some time to come. So um, hopefully that's good news to you. Maybe you already were a firm believer in that. Anyway, thanks for joining everybody. And thanks for everyone who contributed to the discussion. And great to hear some, some questions and some discussions about some of the newer possibilities, even if they're not gung-ho on them. <laughs> thank, well, thank you, Maria. Maria. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Have a <laughs> thank great week. So much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye.